is absolute convergence. So absolute convergence does refer to absolute value. It doesn't refer to absolute value of the sum. It refers to absolute value of each individual term. So if any of them were negative, you just force them all to be positive. So what you're going to look at is summation. So we'll write if infinite sum AK converges. Then we say that summation without the absolute value, we say this summation converges absolutely. So if your absolute value of each term, if that series converges, then you can say your series absolutely converges. So pretty much the times you're going to use this are, there's a few different times. If your series is always positive, this is really irrelevant because absolute convergence is regular convergence. So if your terms were never negative to begin with, it doesn't really, there's really no point to talk about absolute convergence, but you could say if your, every term is already positive, you could say your series converges absolutely if you've checked that. The other times you're going to use it, if you have some series that alternates, but for whatever reason, uh, you don't want to use the alternating series test. You want to use the ratio test. If you find the absolute value converges, you could then say that the series converges. So I think there was one problem that somebody was talking about that they, they used a ratio test, but they used absolute value. They were taking the series and looking for absolute convergence and if you so the next term I'm going to write down is absolute convergence implies regular convergence And regular convergence is sometimes called conditional. I don't really like the word conditional because that implies there's some other condition that has to be met, but it just means convergence. And you don't really need the word regular, but I just, that's just the convergence that we were talking about before. And you may also be wondering, what if every single term was negative? Well, if every term is negative, if you knew it converged, absolutely, then you can just say that it will converge regularly, except whatever sum you get would be negative. So if every term is negative, you could, it's the same as if you made every term positive and just said, well, it's the negative of this. So even if every term is negative, uh, everything I've written down here still works out. Now, if you're going to diverge uh, and every term would be negative, you would diverge to negative infinity in that case. And the other way around is not true. So let me write a warning here. So warning, convergence, regular convergence, does not necessarily imply absolute convergence. It can, uh, a lot of times, if you converge, you get absolute convergence, but not every time. The specific times it's going to fail is if you use the alternating series test and got convergence. Alternating series test does not tell you anything about absolute convergence. So we just saw the harmonic series that we looked at. So this summation negative 1, 1 over n. We just saw that this converged by the alternating series test. So this summation converges by alternating series test. 
However, just regular 1 over n, which absolute, oh, we better put an n power on the negative 1, or else it's not going to alternate. That's pretty important. So absolute value it, what happens is the negative 1 to the n disappears. So we saw this is a divergent harmonic series, or you could say a p equals 1 series. My p looks like a row. There we go. So alternating convergence does not imply absolute. And this is the example. The alternating harmonic series converges, but the absolute, or the regular harmonic series, is not going to converge. So that's basically it for alternating series. That's all we need right there. You need do a couple examples, but there's not very much more to it. This is probably the trickiest part is absolute and conditional, the difference between those two. Next up, we're going to power series. Start with a definition. That's a good place to start. So our regular series doesn't really matter where we start, but we're usually going to be starting at n equals zero. So regular series looks like this. Some term. We used ANs before, but for some reason your book, I believe, uses CNs here. It doesn't really matter. The only difference is you get an extra x to the n power. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky because you have a term that you had before, but then you have x to the nth power. So every single term you go over, you get another multiply by x, multiply by x, multiply by x. So in this case, inside the sum, x is constant. So x is not changing term to term. So you'll fix some x value before you start looking at convergence, and then you'll see, does it converge for this x value? Does it not converge? And what we're going to be doing is figuring out what x value specifically does this converge for. So here, x is constant is constant uh, with respect to the series so you want to think really uh, the n is what changes so the n is what's going to change term to term So here's one. This, this power series I wrote down is centered at 0. Which won't make sense until I write down one that's not centered at 0. So that first one will be centered at 0. And if it's not centered at 0, it will look like this. And this is centered at A. So here we have x minus A to the nth power. So our radius of convergence so we'll use the letter R so our radius of convergence 
you know, let's go with the interval of convergence instead. And then I'll define the, ra the radius off of the interval. So we'll do interval, interval of convergence. Now, just to warn you, the interval is not necessarily open or closed. It could be an open interval, could be closed. It could be open on one side, closed on the other, or closed on one side, open on the other. So it's just going to be some interval. So I'll call it capital I is the largest interval such that x in i, so if you take any x in i, that implies that summation cn x minus a to the n converges. It is possible that your interval is super small and the smallest the interval could ever be is a single number. What number would this series always converge for? What x value would this series always converge for? You only need about three brain cells to answer this. A. So what happens when x is equal to a? What is x minus a? Zero. So every term is going to be zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. So you're guaranteed, guaranteed to have the number a inside your interval. That's the only thing you're guaranteed to get. Um, most of the uh, series we're going to look at are going to have some amount of, uh, you're going to be able to go a little bit bigger than a, a little bit smaller than a. So if we think about number line here, so we're guaranteed to have a in there for sure. Depending on interval could be open or closed. So I don't necessarily want to write open or closed parentheses or brackets because I don't want to apply it. So let me just go, I'll just go open for now. And then, so we'll go open like this, uh, but I will write a note that could be open or closed. And we'll do plenty of examples to check whether they're open or closed. One thing is guaranteed, no matter whether you're open or closed, however much you can go to the left, you can go that exact amount to the right also. So your interval will be basically symmetric about A. So if you can go three to the right, you'll go three to the left also. And once you have this interval right here, the radius is the half of the width of the interval. So it's how much you can go either direction. So this R is the radius of convergence. So that's the radius of convergence. So you're probably wondering, why do they call this a radius? Why don't they call it some other, why does it have this radius property, which makes you sh think of a circle? Could also make you think of a, what's it, a sphere. So why do they call it a radius? So we are looking in, basically we're doing one-dimensional calculus right now. We got one variable, which is x. What would happen if you thought about two inputs, x and y, and you'd be drawing a circle here? And that's why it's called a radius. So you could think of, if, if you just sort of extend this to be, let me use a blue marker here, a circle, this would form a circle right here if it was two dimensions. What would it form if it was three dimensions? It would form a sphere. What would it form in four dimensions? The four dimensional sphere. Same thing, five dimensions, six dimensions, et cetera, et cetera, dimensions. 
So that's why they're going to call it a radius. So it might seem a little weird right now, but that's why it's radius. So all it is is just half the width of the interval. So it's how much you can go over one direction. When you actually go to start testing these, what you're going to find out is you'll most likely use a ratio test to find r, so, or maybe the root test. Uh, the root test can be very good, root or ratio, because either way, that cancels out this n power nicely. It's probably very easy to see why the root test cancels out the n power. Uh, the ratio test, what that's going to do, it'll basically be x minus a to the n plus 1 over x minus a to the n. So those powers will reduce down really nicely. And you'll see that happen when we do some examples. What happens at the two endpoints, right here, when x equals a, you're going to, on one endpoint, a lot of times it's going to alternate. So you're going to find the alternating series test will come into play at one endpoint, and you'll have to get more clever at the other endpoint, because both the root and the ratio test are going to break down at the ends. You're going to get row equals 1 at the ends here. So you're going to have to get more clever. So it might be an nth turn test for divergence. It might be a comparison test, one of the two comparison tests. It might be a, an integral test. And then I think that's about it. That's pretty much all we have. There's two comparison tests, and sometimes they're kind of sneaky of which one you have to use. So we're just going to go and start on some examples. Now I could write out possible inter intervals. Maybe I'll do that right now while we have this nice pretty picture up here. So your possible intervals are going to be, I like to think of them centered at A and with a radius R. So what are the possibilities if it's open? Let's just abuse notation and write these, meaning it can go either way. Instead of writing out four, the four different possibilities. So in math, we call this abusing notation. It doesn't really make sense, but we know what it means. So open or closed. So we're going to have our left endpoint is a minus r, and our right endpoint is a plus r. So that's what it's going to look like. So centered at A, radius R, it looks like A minus R means start at A, go left R, and then plus R, start at A, go right R. So does that make sense, how it matches up with the uh, interval I drew above? And maybe I'll abuse notation up here too, and go like this. And then we can see ah, it could go open, closed, open, closed on either end. So, all right, here that note that I did mention, you have to test endpoints individually. You can save a little time sometimes if you can prove uh, absolute convergence at one of the two, because one of them is going to be an alternating series and the other one's not. The other one will either be all positive terms, well, I shouldn't say that. It won't alternate. It could still alternate in weird situations. But either way, you test your endpoints individually. All right, first up. So we're going to find interval of convergence of summation negative 1 to the n, x to the n over n. And again, it doesn't matter where we start. Obviously, 0 is a bad number to start at because you divide by 0. But it could start at 1, could start at a million. Won't make a difference for convergence. So what's a good test to use? So alternating series won't work unless you know what x is. Because if x is, in this case, if x is positive, it's an alternating series. What happens if x is negative? It'll either be every term positive or every term negative. Do you see that? 
So if x is negative, you got negative number. Let's just say negative 1 to make it easy. That is going to alternate signs. Just the x to the n part would alternate signs, which would cancel out the alternating part over here. So you've got to know what x is if you're going to decide alternating or not. So what test did I say we're going to use all the time in power series? Root and ratio. So we're going to go ratio test. So apply the ratio test right now. Now, when you apply the ratio test, we're going to look for absolute convergence. So I'm going to throw away the uh, negative sign. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm looking for absolute convergence. So I'm just going to absolute value everything. So I don't need to worry about that negative 1 to the n power. So I already went ahead and threw out that negative 1 to the n power. It would have reduced down. We would have had one more negative 1 on the numerator than the denominator, so it would have just put a negative sign in front of the whole fraction. But because we're going absolute value, I don't care that that negative would, that was there. All right, this is an easy reduction right here. We're going to get x times n over n plus 1. So that algebra is pretty easy to see if you've been keeping up on your homeworks. So why is this not necessarily equal to what I wrote? So x could be negative. So if I want it to be equal, I need to absolute value x. So I know the ends for larger values of n, and I said we can't start at 0. So we're going to use positive ends. So the other part's guaranteed positive. So n over n plus 1 won't be negative. So I don't need absolute value there. And what's the last step on the ratio test? So take a limit. So our limit is not, has nothing to do with x. It's all n goes to infinity. So you don't want to think about x changing. And what can you do with constant terms in your limits? Wow. Yep, bring them out front so you can pull out the absolute value of x. That may feel really weird because if you were doing an x limit, you could absolutely not do this. So we're going to bring an x outside a limit, but only because it's a limit of n's, not a limit of x's. So I think we've done enough of these limits to just say it's 1 at this point without going through details. So it's just absolute value of x right there. So that limit turns into 1. You could write times 1, but it's going to look really ugly next to an absolute value sign. So I'd rather not write it. Or maybe if I, if I really want to write it, I could do times 1 like that. All right, this is rho right here. So it's a little strange, rho is a variable. Well, it's not really a variable, it's x, which we said was constant. So from here, what happens if rho is less than 1? So what happens when this, when this is less than 1? What can we say? Converges. Now, I'm not going to write it down, but I will say what happens when absolute value x is greater than 1? Diverges. What happens when absolute value of x equals 1? Yes, we have no idea. So I can start sketching my interval. What number is it centered at? What number is a? 0. So this one's centered at 0. And I can go out. So I'm going to write the measurement of 1 
uh, and one. So over here we have minus one and positive one. What I don't know is what happens at one and negative one. What I do know is in between we're good. We converge. So I know my radius of convergence is one right now. So what do I have to do with these endpoints of a negative one and one? So I need to test them individually. So we're going to individually test. So we'll go negative one on the left, positive one on the right. So I'm going to rewrite the series, which was negative one to the n. And then our x value, which is negative 1 to the n over n. So all I did was swap out x for negative 1 right here. So nothing special. Better drop the infinity in there. All right, what is negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the n? Negative 1 to the 2n. What is negative 1 to the 2n? As long as n is an integer, negative one to any even power, one. positive one. Right, even power, negative one. Okay. So, I could be clever and just say, ah, oh, they cancel out. So they cancel out to positive one when you multiply them together. So our Better leave that in. So this is summation infinity 1 over n. Any algebra questions about what I did? Converge or diverge? Diverge, why? P equals 1 series. You could go integral test on this, but you're going to spend a lot of time doing work. So here's where you want to have some common series written down. So you can say, ah, P equals 1 series, no problem. So this is a di oh, divergent P equals 1 series. Oh, come on. So you have to tell me why. You can't just say divergent because I said so. Not OK. You have to tell me why. So P series is going to be really common. All right, so that's divergent. So I can now say, ah, oh, it does not converge at negative 1. So I'm going to go open over here, not closed. So we threw out negative 1. So I want you right now to test positive 1. Should be even easier. So test positive 1. I'll be nice enough to write it down for you. So why does this converge? Alternating, Alternating series test. So I'm going to be lazy and say, look back at the last problem we did. But on your midterm, well, on your final exam at this point, you can't just say, ah, oh, we did some problem in class that was just like that, and it converged. So I'm going to write converge by the alternating series test. Oh, maybe I won't be lazy. I'll write out really quickly. One, you got the negative one to the n is the alternating. 
So that alternates to the, as the terms get smaller, is that right? The absolute values get smaller, yeah. So we got one over n plus one is less than one over n, so terms get smaller. And last up, lim one over n and approaches infinity equals zero. So those are our three things that we needed right there. Okay, so we converge at one. That means I can include one right there. So we're gonna write out our interval And this is our interval of convergence. And if I ask about the radius, which is takes a little less work to get the radius than it does to get the interval. So there's your radius of convergence. So questions on the first example, the easiest power series example we're going to do. So our final answer is, here's your interval, here's your radius. So, so the radius is just what you get from the limit once you take the x out? It would be, so when we do our ratio or root test, whichever one we do, let's see if there's some room up here. So when we do the ratio or the root test, What we're going to get is we'll get some limit L. It's basically going to look like L. Absolute row is going to equal L, some number, so our limit number, times absolute value of x. And we want this to be less than 1 for convergence. So all we're going to do is just divide by L right there. So we happen to get one, so it was super easy, but, but if we got three, for three times the absolute value of x, our in interval, our radius would be one third. So whatever number you get, it's basically the reciprocal of that number. So your radius is gonna be the reciprocal of your, whatever your limit value is. Didn't feel like that with one because the reciprocal of one is one. So we, we didn't really have to think about doing anything. Did that answer, answer your question? I don't see another example in my notes, but we need to we need to do at least one more example. So I'll just make one up. Sure. So you can see factorials. You can see uh, like a geometric type uh, coefficients. You want a factorial example? Sure. They suck. That's a really good attitude. But I want to learn more. All right. And then they won't suck. Excellent. And I think at some point I said factorial is you always want to go ratio, right? Like you really can't go root. Yeah. So if you got factorial, you, you're forced to go ratio. So this will be number 12 from the book.
And let's center this not at zero. Let's get crazy and go x minus pi to the n. It won't be bad, I promise. I generally don't pick hard problems for myself to do. I pick hard ones for you to do. <laughs> Although when I answer homework questions, I'd much rather answer the hard ones than the easy ones. They're way more exciting. All right, so I want you to solve this one. So you have to use the ratio. Can't go with the root. So you're going to have to go with the ratio. So we'll write down n plus 1. It's pretty easy. But there's three places you've got to modify n. And we're going to be going absolute value here. We're looking for absolute convergence. It's going to be important because x minus pi can be positive or negative. You don't know, depending on what value x is. So go ahead and do your best to simplify this down as much as it can. Yeah, the n plus 1 term is numerator, and the n term is denominator. If you flip them over, you would get the opposite conclusion that rho bigger than 1 would converge and smaller than 1 would diverge. And then once you've done all your algebra simplification you can do, go ahead and, and take a limit and see what you get. And are there any questions on how to get started? Uh, it should, so the very last part, you should get some stuff times x minus pi to the first power. So the stuff is really important part of it, but the x minus pi should, you get one more in the numerator than the denominator. So you'll just be left with x minus pi. And that's where your absolute value has to remain, because we don't know, depending on what x is, could very well be negative. Yeah. In the in, inside of this limit, it will be constant because we're taking this is an n limit, not an x limit. 
And just remember, it's going to feel weird because you've been taking limit x limits for uh, a quarter, two quarters at this point, really. So it just it all depends what what variable your limit is actually using. All right. So any questions on our simplification or the row equals zero? All right. So row equals zero. Does it matter what x is? Nope, as long as it's a number, you're good to go. So x can be any real number here. So x can be any real number. So we'll say our interval is negative infinity, positive infinity. Now x is not allowed to be infinity or negative infinity. That's not allowed. I mean, we could think about that. It, it's not really part of this class. You could say, well, what happens if x is actually infinity? What is your first term if x is infinity? Too much thinking. Just look at your series. What's your first term if x is infinity? Infinity. So you're done. Diverge. I don't care what you add or subtract. Same thing with negative infinity. You're done right there. All right, so we have, in this case, an infinite radius. So if you wanted to write out r, you would say it's inf infinitely big. There's not 10 million. It's infinitely big. And the good news is I don't have to check endpoints right here. I already said why they're not going to work. So this one happens to be open. So if you get the biggest interval, it's going to be open. If for some reason uh, the other conclusion, the other sort of extreme conclusion, if you got rho equals you know, x minus whatever a number times infinity, there's only one x value this will work for, which will be at x equals a. So this is the other extreme case. So this only works, or I should say converges, for x equals a. So these are the two extreme cases. You either get 0 is means everything converges, or if you get infinity, it means just the x value that makes it 0 converges. Anywhere in between, you'll get a radius that is a positive number. So you could get 1, which we saw. You could get any other fraction, whole number, uh, anything else. So this should help you start on a bunch of your power series homeworks. And tomorrow we're going to do some crazy algebra where we multiply power series together. <laughs>